Thank you so much for having me here today at Design Espresso. I'm coming from you all the way from Austin, Texas. Um, so today I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about uh, building collaboration, culture, and trust through design. Over the past decade, I have been working in-house at a, first a global tech company where I was one of a couple thousand designers um, who work in over 44 different countries around the world. And over the past year and a half, I was at Airbnb where I was one of a couple hundred. And as Elisa mentioned, I recently um, moved into management and actually started working uh, for the first time remotely uh, as a uh, UX manager at Shopify. And through these experiences, what I have learned is that design systems are really integral to the way that our organizations operate holistically. No longer are design languages thought of as these static brand bibles, but instead they're more interactive. They're thriving ecosystems of evolving products and more importantly communities that shape how people work and how users experience what we make. They also provide a philosophy, and that talks about why and how things look and feel and perform, and the design assets in the code to make anything from a digital app to an advertisement to a physical piece of hardware. So the impact of a design system in an organization like the companies that I've worked for starts usually as a small grassroots movement, probably a designer and a developer um, in one pocket of the company. And over time, the demand starts to spread like wildfire. But once a system gets traction, my question is, how do you keep it thriving? Is it possible to build a design system in the future that outlasts our careers and gets passed down to the next generation of professionals? I actually believe that that's true. And so today I'm here to talk to you about how the design of culture and collaboration can build trust and resilience into your system. But before I get started, I just want to set a baseline for how I'm thinking about design systems. So as Juho mentioned, defining design today is pretty messy business. It's so many things. It's a discipline, it's a process, it's an action, an outcome, most importantly, a mindset, right? And designers are supposed to be good at all of it. But at the intersection of all these different types of design is different types of relationships. And those are relationships between the things that we make and how we think, relationships between people who we work with who may have a very different definition of design than we do, and relationships between products and users, all driven by small decisions that we make over time. With so many decisions to make, systems are put in place to govern the smaller decisions that organizations have already aligned around and to automate some road tasks that designers used to do, like drawing certain kinds of rectangles. If you ask any designer today, uh, it's common that they'll tell you that they want to make the world a better place because they know that design is not about designers. Design is about problem solving for people and for their environment. And Designers are freed up to focus their creativity on user experiences when design systems offer a healthy rationale and reasonable constraints. Often, design system talks focus on technical achievements, but today I'm going to talk to you about how we can help designers make a human impact. Most designers today are in some kind of relationship with a design system. They either make one or they use one or likely a little bit of both. And this is because companies are increasingly asking us to facilitate more complex decision making. We're not just designing screens and flows anymore, but oftentimes the data models, machine learning models, and business models that are hidden underneath the surface. And those things all have an effect on people. So with that in mind, I want to talk to you about the first quality I look for in a good designer and a good design system. Kind of like a good city planner, designers have to design sustainable systems that are resilient and they endure and they adapt to change. And I'll tell you that my first team at IBM had to learn this lesson the hard way. Resilience, by definition, is all about how we respond when we're faced with challenges. Do we recoil and deflect, blame someone else, or take responsibility and act? In the same lens, do our design systems spring back? Are they flexible and strong enough to work for everyone, or do they fall apart? 
So at IBM, when we first started building a design language, we needed a framework for how we would make decisions. This set of questions uh, came from Shelley Evanson and John Reinfrank, who were a couple of designers who actually created the first design language for photocopiers in 1996 out in Xerox Copy Park. And so far, it's been some of the best design thinking that I've found for design languages. Um, so just for a moment, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes and move away from Design Espresso just for a second. OK, now go ahead and open them. Imagine that you just started a new job, and they told you that, they, that you had to use these products to do your work. Raise your hand if you might run out screaming. <laughs> There's a reason for that. At IBM, our question to what came before our design language was a component library called One UI. And it was made for engineers by engineers, full of a lot of plug-and-play widgets that were all coded in a single programming framework called Dojo. And basically what that meant was that they could build and ship software without really ever talking to a designer. In the absence of design, this user experience was not meeting the needs of new types of knowledge workers uh, that we built software for. So these are people like doctors, uh, biologists, pilots, uh, data analysts who rely on these insights in order to do their jobs. <clears throat> so IBM went ahead and hired, um, made a big investment, $100 million in design, um, hiring at over 2,000 de designers in the past five years. And I was one of those first designers who was um, asked to help set the culture and build a practice around a design language. And so what we were trying to do, we had a lot of early career um, designers that were straight out of college, and we wanted to free them of the prescription of coded solutions and instead promote creativity, inspiration, uh, and help beginners make better decisions. And so this is why our first design language came without any components. Instead, it was about the vision for unity, not uniformity, across a lot of different examples. <clears throat> so this all started in 2014. And our head of design sponsored our design language pretty fast. It was a matter of weeks. We were sending out blog posts and different draft versions um, of <clears throat> new icons, color palettes, and typography for community feedback. And then I went on a roadshow to teams all across IBM to share the values and principles of the language. At the same time, we were testing and workshopping with teams and doing different activities to bring diverse perspectives into the process. So in this one, in particular, we sent out posters of our icons without any labels underneath across our global offices in places like Mexico or Johannesburg or Boblingen, Germany, to uh, write what people thought each one of these icons meant underneath. And this was a really interesting exercise. It helped us understand that in certain cultures, for example, our overview icon, which was just a single eyeball, could be seen as kind of ominous or intimidating. And that was something that, culturally, we were not expecting to find. Eventually, we started getting enough momentum from these learnings across the company to start building a team. And in a matter of months, we were charged to make this website. The idea was that we wanted it to feel like a, a maker space, maybe like a wood shop uh, that you were in in high school, and that sense of having a teacher there who could help guide you. But really, you're focused on making something creative and innovative yourself. Um, but in less than a year, we had gone from zero to one, and that makes everything sound super smooth. But a storm was brewing behind the scenes that we never saw coming. We'd been moving really fast, and there was never enough information. We were always going 100 miles an hour inside um, a big enterprise company acting kind of like a startup. So our design language date, and this is back in 2014, again, that was in October, and our head of design was supposed to get up on stage at this really big design and business conference and publicly announce the launch of the site, right? It's supposed to be one of the most exciting moments. But the morning of the talk, he got a call from our chief accessibility officer, uh, who basically gave him a thumbs down to go live with the site. She said that there were serious flaws in the way that it had been coded and designed, and that many solutions would prevent people with certain kinds of disabilities from using our site. 
So obviously this wasn't good for people who were trying to explore the language, and it was also a big risk for the company because we obviously want our teams to be making products that you know, comply with WCAGA guidelines and also that embrace, embrace inclusive practices. So we ended up actually delaying this launch for months, and it wasn't until December that it eventually got released. Pretty much everyone was on holiday, so nobody even knew that it went out, and the team was pretty let down. Um, we hadn't had enough accessibility experts and people with disabilities co-designing um, and giving feedback, so we needed to start engaging these communities. And um, we knew about things like color contrast, but uh, there were so many different aspects of accessibility that the team just didn't know, because it was really our first time doing a lot of this. So, through resiliency, instead of just you know, deciding that we were going to um, you know, learn our lesson, we also built from those learnings. And we created this open source handbook, um, which is also a website for all teams inside and outside of IBM to learn best practices for accessibility and product design. So if you're a product manager or an engineer or a designer, um, you can you know, essentially read and, and learn more in uh, our handbook about how you can be more inclusive in your work and how, um, kind of what your role is uh, on the team in order to uh, make sure that all of our software products are accessible. Um, and this is all just to say that for a design language to last, people need inclusive mindsets and tools integrated into their workflows that encourage positive behaviors. I know that for our team, that wake-up call that we got from the chief accessibility officer, which obviously shook us, um, changed our way of working. And since then, IBM has continued making learning and education central to making a sustainable system and, more importantly, a really resilient designer population. So one last note on resiliency. The design language I shared with you was eventually deprecated at IBM. So the website I showed you that we were all really excited about it actually uh, ended up getting taken down. And the reason why we did this was because we wanted to actually bring in our marketing teams, our digital teams, our content teams, and bring them along in the organization to evolve the design language together. We were willing to pretty much give up everything that we had made and start from scratch, because we wanted to give everyone a voice and a seat at the table to invent something new together. So this is the team, and we're all working from different places, and every Friday we would get together and essentially meet to talk about every new element that we were building um, from scratch. So today, um, this is the new design language at IBM, and it's not just for software product teams, but it also serves editorial, event design, environmental design, hardware, and it pretty much extends across all touch points of the user experience. So the lesson here was that in the face of adversity, we demonstrated the flexibility to fix things and to start over and over. And we didn't hold on too tightly necessarily about around the things that we had made, but instead we held tightly to the things that we learned. And we carried those things forward to improve the system with every iteration. So the second quality I want to talk to you about today is this idea of building trust. And in systems, trust means uh, that it's not just about having you know, the, all of the pieces and parts that you need to uh, kind of make a craft, right? Make some kind of um, design. It's also the things behind the scenes. So things like infrastructure and operations that enable teams to make decisions and designs and code to be reused and recycled by a community. Um, so when I started at Airbnb, uh, which was just a couple years ago, their system already existed, and its goal was to make it faster and easier to make consistent and beautiful products. Uh, a team at that time was actually assembled to redesign their product flow, and out of that they created a design system. Um, and more importantly, they also built out a pattern library for developers. But trying to build the system and redesign the product at the same time came with a lot of challenges. So the DLS was a template, a code library, and some tools. And when I started as a new hire, I got a one-hour onboarding to this design language system. And then I was kind of sent on my way. If I got stuck, I could go to a weekly office hour for Q&A, um, and that was the extent of the design language for a couple of years, 
at Airbnb. And this is because the core team who designed it, they built the system, it was very robust, and they knew the guidelines like the back of their hand. But they never wrote them down. So as more teams started to use it, and people like me who had just joined, uh, people started to ask questions. I asked one. <laughs> one of the questions I asked the team was, when should I use gradients? Uh, and someone would say, well, mm, they're for special moments. <laughs> and uh, I asked a special moment for whom? Um, it was obvious that the system hadn't been fully rationalized yet. We still had a few loose screws. Um, so out of my own struggle came a new mission. And this was focused not on the product, but on the people. How could we operate as these system stewards and build trust with the community who's trying to use the system? So my first instinct was to take this Excel spreadsheet where all of the teams lived and visualize all of these relationships between teams. I spent pretty much doing nothing for the first three months other than listening. So going and meeting with all of these people and understanding who were the attractors of the system and the advocates and the allies and who were people who were detractors and people that we needed to win over and listen to and understand why it wasn't working for them. Um, so very traditionally, like it usually goes with design language systems, in Act 1 we had an offering and then in Act 2 we wanted to build out operations. Um, so this is things like contribution processes, shared ownership models, and enable people to essentially give back to the community. So from that, there were three things that helped people really understand their relationship and work more closely with the system and our team. And I'm going to share a couple of them with you today. Um, so many teams were using our design language system who weren't necessarily even making interfaces. These were people like legal, finance, uh, people in data science and HR who were all still applying things like the design principles and even their color pal our color palette to things like a keynote presentation or event materials. Um, and we wanted to find a way for them to participate in the research too. So what I asked them to do was write a love letter or a breakup letter to the design language. And essentially, I wanted them to feel like the design language was a person that they were in a relationship with and get them to talk to us more about not just how they use the system, but how they feel about it. So this was a video that I made to play for our design leadership, and I'll play it here for you. DLS, I love you because you make my life so easy. But sometimes adding new components or modifying an existing one is so hard. DLS. It's complicated. I love you so. However, I need you to be more open. In the past, you communicated so well. But now I can never find your single source of truth. Uh, dear DLS, I do love you, but I need a break. Because there isn't a clear way to collaborate on changes or propose and then implement updates. Hey DLS, I've had a great relationship with you so far. I love that you strive to create consistency and make me more productive. You provide templates and documentation and tools. You also have partners embedded across various teams. These are all great, but it is hard to use all of the offerings and the process of contributing to DLS is still very opaque. So, Instead of the traditional way of kind of measuring the design language system health, it might be something like tracking components um, or you know, seeing how many things uh, are being used um, from your asset library. Getting this kind of engagement with teams helps align our uh, leadership towards a vision. This is a photo of our design director who got up off of um, the, his seat and immediately started um, coming up with ideas around how to improve the um, design language experience for our team. And it was kind of the first time that our team had ever actually started kind of collaborating holistically with other teams on um, how we could improve the system. Uh, the first thing that we wanted to do was actually just design this idea of partnership. How could we you know, help teams feel like they were co-creators? And so uh, we created this partnership program um, to hack the system, essentially. It was like a hackathon where teams could come up with ideas for how to improve the system. They really wanted um, UX patterns, and they really wanted themeability to give it um, kind of the opportunity to change across different sub-brands. And so um, this wasn't about them just bringing our, their ideas to us and, and us then going and doing those things. It was actually us hearing from them and then becoming facilitators 
for them to actually go and solve that problem, which meant also building relationships with their managers to free them up to work on the design language, not just their product. Um, and essentially, they you know, came up with new ideas, um, and they started to see the design language system not as just like a set of constraints anymore um, that was holding them back, but instead as something that they could innovate on together. Um, so a year later, I can safely tell you that a design system is only as strong as the relationships that you have with the teams who use it. And one designer in our programs that we surveyed said that essentially this partnership program was the best thing about the design language system since it had been created. Um, so the last quick thing I'm going to highlight here that we worked on was a contribution model. Um, it was really historically hard for teams to reuse the system and oftentimes we would see people go to Airbnb.com and they would screenshot a part of the product and then they'd go into Figma and they'd redesign the entire screen before they could really get started. And so we wanted to you know, reduce that friction and enable people to find other teams' components. Um, and more importantly to me, you know, it was that the teams never saw their work um, actually reflected back to them in the system. And that meant, as a design language, we were asking people to use something that they really weren't a part of and they didn't belong to. So we created a pretty simple contribu contribution model. Um, and it just meant that all teams could give back. Um, it didn't matter that the component was a certain level of quality. It was, like I mentioned, all about findability. And as part of this process, designers would volunteer an hour a week to review components for other designers. Um, so it was very collaborative. And essentially, it wasn't about making decisions with this checklist about whether the component was good enough. They would all be accepted. But it was about to marking like what is actually baked in this component. So does it have certain accessibility um, baked in, or performance metrics, or other things that um, as a designer, you could go and see, oh, this thing has actually made a lot of progress. Let me continue to improve upon this component and contribute it back over and over. So um, we had over a dozen contributions in the pilot um, across different teams and sent out a newsletter to celebrate those teams. But our vision ultimately was just create a collective of caring stewards across the company, um, hoping that this sort of behavior would just be business as usual eventually. I think design systems have also the potential to help designers make the world a better place when we focus on inclusion and sustainability. Um, we can give teams and users the ability to be seen and heard and depicted in authentic ways. Trust building requires a deep listening, not just to your internal teams, but just as important, their end users. So in our case, that was hosts and guests who all had a very diverse background and different ability levels. So recently, one of my former colleagues um, said that in his research, he ran across a guest uh, with blindness who said something that will always stick with me. Uh, they said, I don't want to browse the internet and have a separate experience in accessibility mode. I want to use the same thing as what everyone else uses. The internet's one of the safest places for me because it's where my disability is disguised from everyone else. I don't want to be relegated to some kind of digital ghetto. When we design systems, we have to choose actively not to perpetuate the kind of segregation, discrimination, and exclusion that happens to people in the physical world. We need to aspire to one universal experience which includes the widest diversity possible for our community. And that was part of the overarching goal of the design system at Airbnb. So this is just a prototype from our product, Solve for One, You Solve for Many. It's the idea of giving all guests the ability to explore a home that they want to book, um, kind of like you do Google Maps, where you can almost do an entire walkthrough of the home virtually. Um, this concept could certainly benefit people with physical or cognitive disabilities, like my mom, who oftentimes has seizures and would definitely want to check a space for well-lit staircases, guarded handrails with both sides, or light switches at the top and bottom. Um, exploring these stairs is also really valuable for maybe people like families who have young children. So you can see how benefits can exponentially scale across people and their needs. Um, so, you know, again, just to highlight that, there might be the possibility using machine learning. Um, you could uh, detect certain objects in a space as well. 
And this could help both wheeled and walking people who may have things like luggage or strollers um, or physical devices get a sense of the width of a door, which might help them make decisions about whether to stay at one place or another. Um, these are pretty provocative examples to me, um, but I think it's also important to keep in mind that there can be a lot of unintended consequences if we don't thoroughly try and test these ideas. So I'd like to wrap up today by talking to you about what I'm currently working on at Shopify. Um, I work on a team called Polaris for Everyone, and we are trying to help design cohesive experiences across a lot of different environments. Um, Essentially, it helps people who are you know, designing screens that work for a lot of non-traditional spaces. It could be, for example, different lighting conditions in a warehouse environment, um, or teams who meet with merchants in a store, and they start to realize that the, their, their devices um, might be like actually stationary on um, a desk, and they're having to stretch their arms maybe like 100 times a day to reach for a very small touch target. Um, so my job's a little bit different now. I'm working remotely with teams, as I mentioned, and um, it's challenging co-creating remotely, but it's definitely not impossible. So this is just an example um, of something very functional. It's a journey map template that I built early this, earlier this week, um, and it'll be used to imagine how a team will want to work with our team in the future and work with the design system. So this is just essentially a video of us working together. Um, and I really just believe that remote work is inclusive work. Um, I've started mapping with two teams, and it's it, pretty exciting because you can start recording the conversations. People share out the different steps that they're taking and their ideas of the needs that they have. And we're collaborating in one environment using a great design tool that I recommend called Figma to do this kind of work. Um, Regarding collaboration, I've facilitated many, many, many activities like this, and I just want to say that you can include people in any stage of your process, um, whether that's real-time, asynchronously, whether that's to generate ideas or to evaluate them um, and measure success. The goal of all of that is that we just don't need to work in silos anymore. You don't even have to work by yourself. Even if you don't work with other designers, you're not alone. If there's one piece of advice I'd leave with you today, it would also be to get interested in as many things as possible outside of design. Find a data scientist, a doctor, a dancer to work with, and come up with your own collaboration activities. I'd love to see them. Um, so lastly, I just want to talk about culture. Quickly defined, it's our behavior over time. And there was um, a great uh, sociologist and ethnographer at IBM who created this framework for how you can think about culture. It's made up of different dimensions. Um, these are dimensions you can use to have conversations with your teams about how you would design for it. Um, and those are values. So these are people's internalized articulation of what matters to them. Um, rituals, different behaviors and activities that you do that bring the culture to life different leaders in the company who are role models, who demonstrate those behaviors and live the values, and then symbols, which are our smallest atomic unit of culture. They're these iconic, immediate, and universally recognizable things that stick to us like glue. So these are just reflection questions based on that four set of four dimensions of culture that you can consider um, when talking to your teams about the kind of organization that you want and also the kind of design system that you'd like to build. How many of you have heard of a designer named Patty Moore? Is anyone familiar with her? Um, so she is one of the leaders uh, for me in design. And in the mid-1970s, she was working at a company called Raymond Lowy. They made the Coke bottle and the Shell logo. And during a planning meeting, she once asked her uh, boss, she said, couldn't we design our refrigerator doors so that someone with arthritis could easily open it? And her boss said, Patty, <laughs> We don't design for those people. Um, and she was pretty incensed. So she decided to, for two years, dress up um, as an 80-year-old woman. And she put on makeup and um, kind of glasses and a brace to essentially um, you know, force her to experience what it would be like uh, to be an aging person. She visited over 100 American cities with this persona, um, attempting to negotiate the world around her, and she experienced some pretty real challenges. 
um, between shopping in su supermarkets or catching the bus, um, opening a can opener. She was at one point robbed, beaten, and left for dead by a gang who attacked her. Um, thankfully, Patty's okay. She started her own design firm, and she's made a thriving business off of designing for those people. So, as you keep in mind, a good outcome may not produce any design artifacts at all. Recently, I uh, took a look at a page in a book um, from Charles and Ray Eames, and he said the first step in designing a lamp or anything else should be not to think about how it looks, but whether it should even exist in the first place. I'll leave you with that, and I just want to say one last thing. When designers are freed up to think bigger about design systems, I want you to think about reaching for that highest form of human impact to make the world a better place. Thank you.